Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's kick off today. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, my name is Omar Abdi. I'm your host today for the very first LinkedIn local meetup that's happening in uh, Karachi, in, uh, in Pakistan, in fact. Today we are, uh, we're going to talk to and hear from four very, very interesting people. And uh, I'm going to do a very quick introduction, uh, although actually none of them need me to do that. Um, starting from the left, Jaji Seja, the CEO of ARY Networks. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to actually tell us a little bit about themselves in their own words, because A, the host can never do justice to, uh, to the person they're introducing. B, they tend to embarrass the hell out of them. Um, and I, I, I prefer not to do that. Because I would like them to come and join us in other events in the future, as opposed to, oh no, that event, I'm never going back again. Um, second, we have Faran Qureshi, who is the regional head for Google. Uh, Pakistan is one of the markets that he goes after, so uh, thank you both gentlemen for being here. Uh, we have here two, two Aishas. It's a complete coincidence, not a plan. Uh, Dr. Aisha Khan is the, uh, the CEO and country head of Acumen Pakistan. And um, Aisha Aziz is the CEO and Managing Director of Bath Renai Investment Company. Um, I'm looking forward to a very interesting discussion. Um, we do have mics here, but what I would request is, if you could please hold your questions till the, uh, till the end, which, which won't be that far away, unless of course it's an absolute burning necessity that you absolutely must ask that question at that point or you will explode. In that case, actually that's not funny, no explosions here, please. Uh, in that case, please do put up your hand and I will try and, and have someone bring, bring a mic to you. But otherwise, please, uh, please do engage, uh, please do uh, write down your questions, keep them, uh, keep them at hand and uh, look forward to a very stimulating discussion. So with that, uh, would you mind please introducing yourself? Hello. Anyways, uh, I think can can anyone get me back? Yes. Uh, I'm Jirji Seja. I'm a chief executive for ARY Digital Network. I've been with ARY for the last 13 years. Uh, basically, I am a media specialist. I have a background uh, from media planning, media buying, to media productions, uh, television, content, and uh, now uh, management. Uh, I would say that my strength is development of content and linking it to the marketing world. So that's uh, where I see myself uh, as a specialist of creating content for the marketing world and creating the communication line between your audience and the world of the smart game. My name is Farhan Kuresh. I look after the corporation for the world market for the Pakistan. I've been in the industry for about 20 years, but the world is going to be there for the world. Excellent. Welcome, Yes, Hi. Good morning, everyone. So great to see everyone. Excited and awake. So early in the morning. It is early. Anyway, as Farhan mentioned, I am the country head of Acumen. Acumen is an impact investment fund, and what that means is we make investments in companies that provide goods and services. And so this is our way of finding ways of addressing poverty and finding solutions for that. Along with that, we have a leadership program as well. If you want to be Acumen Fellows program, that is also part of what Acumen does. Uh, I moved back to Pakistan about uh, seven years ago, which seems like yesterday. And since then, I've been primarily in the finance sector. But um, a while ago, I also did some media. We'll talk about it at some point. I suppose you can ask me about that. But, uh, Overall, my goal in life throughout my career always has been to make a positive impact in society. And I've tried doing that in different ways. 
everything I'm doing is relaxing, so I would like to engage more with others. Excellent. Thank you, Asha. Yes, Asha. question I actually have, we'll start with Aisha, is uh, you mentioned homegrown talent. So what do you think are the opportunities? Because a lot of young people that I speak to nowadays are interested in moving abroad. Um, one way or the other, by hook or by crook. Immigration, study, um, you know, whatever whatever options they have, find a job in Dubai. Um, what, what is your take on the opportunities for homegrown talent in Pakistan? Well, actually, those opportunities, you don't have to Grown. Those are opportunities that anyone in Pakistan, whether they study from abroad and come back or they study here. The, the issue is, I think we're going through a phase of change. When we graduated, everyone knew they wanted to go to the city bank or the and, you know, there were a number of other multinationals, so if you were talented, and you, you sort of got into those places, you had a, a certain career path that was structured for you. I think that's no longer the case. Foreign banks are out. There are very few foreign banks left in Pakistan and they're not growing. Pharmaceutical companies, I, you know, I'm sure everyone knows, 80% of them have already exited. And it is the local groups that are now taking over and that are growing and that have an appetite for Pakistan and perhaps more foreign investors didn't have. Working in a foreign bank uh, so many years ago, I knew that we were primarily lenders to the government. We didn't really want to be uh, in the market. And I think as that changes, we have opportunities for particularly in entrepreneurship, uh, particularly related to technology, because that has brought down values in many industries. And I think people have to now work and understand that local groups also provide uh, good employment opportunities. So you know, that's the that's the direction I think Fantastic, thank you. Um, my first question to, uh, I can't call you the other Aisha, but Dr. Aisha. Th thank you, Dr. Dr. Aisha. Um, you uh, gave up a career at Harvard Business School to return to Pakistan. Can you talk a little bit about that thought process? Because most people here in the room <coughs> would think that you were insane. So, let me be very accurate about it. HBS, and it's a privilege, right? You want to talk a little bit about that? I get comfortable when you ask me uh, the other questions that we have talked about. But uh, I didn't really give up Harvard Business School. I think it's a part of a person's career um, growth overall, right? So I did my doctorate there, I was very happy, and I was going to start working at what I thought would be my dream job, which was a job at Goldman Sachs in New York. And I thought, all right, everything is set. I actually had no intention of coming back to Pakistan. Right? So, so you know, you never know. 
part of my philosophy in life. That things happen, things that sometimes go in a very different direction, and you go with it, and sometimes it's so much better than you even anticipated. So the only reason I actually came back, um, we had a personal uh, circumstance. My father passed away very unexpectedly. He was in his 50s, and none of us thought that it's something that would ever happen. I was the eldest child. I left home at 16, and I never really... You know, I've been doing all sorts of things in America, education, work, everything else. And I thought my life was over there. Particularly as a woman, I thought, hey, I have so many degrees of freedom over there. Why would I ever come back? I'm, I'm doing all these things. I'm excelling. Um, at that point, when my father passed away, I realized that you know, things in Pakistan can sometimes be very unpredictable. There are no systems in place. I had my mother and a younger brother, and nobody knew how to handle this. We had two small family businesses. Nobody knew how to deal with the lawyers, navigate the space. So I said, okay, I am going to come back for two years. And I thought of it as, okay, I'm coming back to my family. I'm going to just put my work and my ambition and everything else on hold. And it's probably going to be miserable because, you know, I had sort of, in those decades that I've been there, I also visited Pakistan only for the winter, for the wedding season, and everything else was like, oh my god, things are so terrible here. I, just, I don't know, career-wise, there's no golden tax in Pakistan. I just like, what am I going to do? There's no HBS. Um, so I came back, and uh, it was uh, sort of jumping a little bit into what the challenges were of transitioning back into a country without any network, right? Just by that uh, everything I knew and understood, all the systems didn't really work here. This was very much a place in which when I went out, people would ask me, well, what does your husband do? Or what does your father do? And I just you know, didn't have a husband. I mean, my father had passed away, and I didn't really think that was um, something that defined who I was. So um, I came back, and frankly, Pakistan can be an equally challenging and difficult place to adjust to when you're not. But the things that I believe make you succeed in any country are even more so true here as you're navigating a new place. And it starts by, again, just having confidence and faith in yourself and asking people for help. So I went and I asked a lot of people for help. I, I'm here. Um, I have no plan. Uh, this is what I sort of done. This is my skill set. And I've been incredibly lucky. I uh, met Mr. Zakir, who used to be the president of HBL Bank back then, and he was incredibly gracious. He took this huge chunk on me. He said, you know, why don't you come? We don't have a strategy function. Will you be the head of strategy and set up the whole strategy department for HBL? And I was like, wow, here's a bank with over 15,000 employees, 300 branches. I knew nothing about Pakistan, how banking in Pakistan. Someone is trusting me enough to actually give this huge task to me, absolutely I'll do it, right? So I jumped in as the first head of strategy at HBL, um, probably the youngest head of a group at that time ever. Um, and, you know, I had time to the people would say, Ah, oh, I mean, yeah, the bank is the Harvard I came in with the Iga, I'm 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, it, it required a lot of just listening and, and just developing that ability, that learning muscle that I think is very important for everyone to have. How do you how do you step into a new space and start developing and growing? And I can't thank Zakir Stark enough for the chance he took on me back then because that sort of shifted me into slab bank mainstream Pakistan banking. Figure it out, right? Anything that worked at Harvard Business School, all the models I studied, I was a consultant in the QB in New York before, worked with financial sector companies. None of those things worked here. It was a very different space. And um, I started learning very quickly a skill that you need more and more of as you develop in your career is this uh, skill of building consensus, right? You may intellectually have the right solution to something. It, it doesn't really matter. And until you can get everyone on board and everyone excited and everyone working on it, it's irrelevant whether you have the solution. And frankly, the, the solution is quite straightforward. Most people can sort of think hard and say, all right, this is what we need to be doing. This department needs to do this. 
exact to do that. So, um, so to answer your question, it was a choice to come back in the sense of I looked at my career options and navigated and I said, yes, instead of Goldman Sachs, I'm going to go to Pakistan and sort of, you know, figure out what I'm going to do there. It was a choice in which, and, and I think it's true for everyone in life, right? I think you have different times in your life in which you prioritize different things. I prioritized family at that point. And I said, this is my responsibility. I need to be back with a duty and an obligation. And while doing that, I found career development of a sort that I could not dream of having in New York. I, I, the things I've learned over the past seven years that I've been here, the ways in which I've grown, I could not imagine having that sort of trajectory there. So I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who has helped me along the way. Um, it's part, part of the reason why I but having this conversation is, I also think that we have to keep passing that on and sort of helping other people as well um, navigate that space. It's, um, it's been an interesting journey and it continues to be very interesting. Excellent. Very well. For someone who claimed that she was very shy at the time and somehow not, not seeing that, Farhat, um, you have recently transitioned into uh, and that has involved a great deal of travel and physically being headquartered outside of Pakistan. Can you talk about that transition and how it's gone for you? Well, it's been an interesting journey. I think a lot of it is because. So, there are a couple of things that kind of made this decision a lot easier. So, for me, moving out of Pakistan was not something I was considering that I didn't want to do. I think initially, when the conversations on who started it, there was a lot of things that were holding was the fact that it was in Europe. I didn't want to move to Europe. Uh, I wanted to stay in the country because I honestly believe that there's a lot more potential here. I'm an optimist by nature. And I really, truly, truly believe that with the 207 million population, which is probably undertaken, probably a lot more. Um, and uh, in the way the internet penetration is growing up, uh, the fact that we have a lot of talented people, I just feel that there's a lot of scope here. And so which is why I mean that decision for me was difficult. Uh, you know, I also had personal situations where you know father was there. Um, but the company has been phenomenal in terms of accommodating me, in terms of understanding. Uh, and I actually spent more time in Pakistan than I do in Singapore. I actually spent like eight days in a month in Singapore. I'm here most of the time. People generally every time they see me, they're like, you here, we have a form. Uh, and I probably have for two days and come back. But uh, which is why the travel uh, takes a toll. But my family has been very supportive, and I think I could not have done it without that. My children and my wife are still here. But in terms of the transition, I think it's just been it's been pretty seamless yeah. because you know in the media industry, as well, in the last few years, talks of technology, digitization, we're already underway. Right? So we're already talking about so that seamless transition happening by just moving into a role which is much more now concentrated around doing the whole digital thing. Um, there's a lot more focus uh, for countries, emerging markets in the international uh, uh, marketplace. So companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, they're all interested uh, in this part of the world. Um, so to me, the I think a couple of things that uh, kind of bothered, and, you know, and, and I'm going to be as well, so I'm going to be confident. Uh, Pakistan, I think those are parts of the chain of office I had and I stayed here for about 10 years before I moved. Good things are changing, neither in Pakistan nor in foreign country, right? So I, I should do both there. People are still people. A lot of work that you need to get done is based on relationships. Whether it's Pakistan, whether it's the US, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's the lot of organization or these countries. You know that builds a level of credibility, that builds a level of security that allows you to do a lot. So if you are in Google my technology company or you know, it doesn't happen that way. You still need to know the people, right? And so that trait is important, as important as Pakistan as it is in any other part of the world. So it's not like Pakistan looks in a totally different continuum. Uh, but the couple of things that I appreciate there is that they are compassionate and respectful. So respectful in terms of people's problems, people's timing. So yeah, maybe the subject would have been I think a lot of people work there. Half an hour meeting will last for about three hours, then you get five minutes of work done. Right? Because you're talking about all kinds of stuff. You know, international arena, mein, 
If you have a 10 minute meeting, then the hard stop at 9 minute 30 seconds and people will leave. So whatever you want, you have to be very focused, structured about what you are thinking and you have to be very clear in articulating that. So for me, those were the... So though that I enjoy in any case. And I think Pakistan is kind of moving in that direction. Right? So like you look at the bigger companies that we have been working for, I mean, for the last 20 years, I ran a media buying house. Uh, some of you may know me from that. Uh, and we worked with a number of clients like Procter & Coop, Anglo, National Food. And, you know, I've seen the process. They've also become much more respectful about, you know, accommodating and realizing value of time and money of other people. So I see that transition happen and it will continue to happen. So we are in a good place. So in terms of transition, we'll see this transition. I'm still here most of the time. Thank you, Parang. JJ, you told me an interesting story once about how you actually entered the media industry because today people say, JJ, yeah, media, okay, fine. But that wasn't always the case. Um, can you please uh, share with the audience how you actually uh, embark on this journey and, and how that happened? <coughs> Uh, I actually think that uh, when you are going through your college life, uh, you have a lot of uh, ideas, a lot of uh, goals that you are setting up, but you don't know exactly what you are going to end up doing. Uh, as Dr. Aisha just mentioned that a lot of times things are not planned. Like when I was in my bachelor's, uh, my father all his life has been in the insurance industry. So he wanted me to come and join him. And I was like, uh, okay, I can explore that. And the first time when I went to his office, uh, where he said, start working there. So I realized that it's going to be something that I will be doing because he's getting me a job. So I thought, okay, let me just explore. I was in a bachelor's. I had a friend in Interflo. He said, why don't you uh, come and join uh, a media department? Uh, there's an internship uh, open there. And I had done an internship at Citibank before that, uh, which I didn't like much. Uh, it wasn't my cup of tea. And that's why I said, okay, I'll uh, go and I'll uh, start it up. So I just went there and in one month's time, I started uh, working for them. Because I felt that, okay, this is what I want to do. Uh, I purely think that you have to be at the right, the right place at the right time. And if you are there, you have to plan. You must know that, okay, this is where we are, uh, this is where I am. And if I work hard, I can make it there. So I remember the days uh, in 1997 when I started, uh, there was no concept of media buying, there was no concept of uh, media planning. Uh, it was all based on uh, personal PR. There was, there was a newspaper, a big newspaper, which used to like sell everything. Um, they, the, the director of marketing and their marketing team will know everyone, and the first ad has to come there. So it's Don, Jung, and they were doing it. And all of a sudden, we, some new kids, we came in. Paran was also part of the same breed. And he said, there will be a time job, we'll be buying GRP. And he said, what the hell is GRP and why would you buy them? He said, no, we're going to buy audience. And it, everything will be, uh, every spot will be accounted for. At that time, there was only one PTV. So if you look at it, that time, there was nothing exciting about me. State-owned television network, PTV, hard to get drama, either, now we have drama, either, and that's it. But then, everything started to work. The research <laughs> came in, the other came in, the people who took. And, we all started working very hard. And from there came in the private sector. Then came the production sector. So I was working for Media Buying House. I brought in uh, Kara Worldwide, it's a uh, you know, Media Buying House. So I brought them in. And while it was going on, I realized that there is a huge scope in the production sector. Uh, the media marketing was happening, but there was no one focusing on production. Like, productions are like a brand. And no one was branding. So I came in first, I started marketing production. So we came out with a concept which was very new in Pakistan, like uh, creating original soundtracks, creating videos for promoting. Uh, I don't know if you've heard the song uh, by Jawad and Madhavi Mehdi Ji Raat, Jodhi Girls Now that was one of my songs that I created just to promote a drama. I called it Mehdi. But then I realized that power of media and the content and how it can connect so I started focusing more at the time on the production side and uh, did some big projects and then eventually I realized that okay, media buying and planning is there but I am enjoying more on the production and the uh, content side. So I moved on to a channel where I could flex my muscles and it's again getting, I joined ARY, I was going and I was setting up my own business. 
So I made mistakes about God and I said, listen, I'm doing this and I want to start my own personal business. And he said, okay, good, why don't you do it? And uh, from side of this, we had a chat in the car and by the end of the, the trip, he said, why, do you, why don't you just come and join me instead of uh, doing the revolution? And whatever you want to do, you may take 10 years to come reach that. I'm offering you that today. And I said, I a lot of sense. Why not? And I grabbed the opportunity. <laughs> Because what I could have done in the next 10 years, I started doing it immediately. So I became a executive director for AIW Network and from there, uh, there's no looking back. We have done some amazing projects. So I personally think that uh, you have to enjoy what you do, you must like it and you must know where you are. And if you are at the right place, just grab it. Don't miss it. Don't wait for it. Or don't say that maybe there's another opportunity that's going to come. That's awesome. Oh, that, that's an excellent. Uh, <coughs> thank you for that. Aisha, coming back to you. Um, I know that one of your passion points is the inclusion of women in the workforce in Pakistan, particularly in the form of financial sector. So, would you say that we are making strides in the right direction there right now? Yes. I'd like to mention how I started my career in the BDSA. As a trainee, I remember I was doing the And I was given a my main colleague traveled as a coach. And believe me, I was a beneficiary of the system where it was a very sexist policy. He treated women <coughs> like, uh, I don't know, precious you know, something precious, some, some you know, people who had to be protected. And that was uh, obviously not good from a career progression perspective. I don't think that. Thought process is there anymore. There are two women on the stage right now. Nobody is going to send any training on a business class to get anywhere. So those things have changed. But there's another thing that I'd like to mention. You, you said financial space, women uh, in financial sector, but that's just you know representative of the society at large. And if somebody is watching TV a few before yesterday and saw Asma Jai in the field room, you see there were women. Uh, at the funeral. And they, I mean, I thought that was quite amazing. It's the kind of change that is gradually happening in different pockets of the country. And uh, it's as clear a change as any. For a woman, for many women, hundreds of them, to be in a pure male state, which is in a Mandir Janaza in a graveyard, is a kind of Transition that's taking place in this country. Something very interesting, you know, you can Google, uh, I call Google the new God because they're going to be uh, knowing how we think, the kind of information that is available. And so many of the things that they used to do and used to see, I think that's going to change very drastically. It has been changed already uh, in the kind of information that's available. The way package and sell your products, I think, I think the world is changing very, very fast. It's been Pakistan, I'm still not away from that. Uh, no problem. Very good. Thank you. Um, yes, Google Baba knows everything. Yeah. It's like, that's, I don't know how many people that's, that's, that's what I thought. Google Baba. George Orwell? Yes. I think he was writing about you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 not to put her on, on, on the spot or anything, but sure. Um, okay, uh, Dr. What I'm saying is that those old uh, attitudes and the conventions that we, we used to, I think many of those things are going to be uh, not there. They're going to disappear. And uh, women, men, they're going to be competing behind possibly anonymous sports, but we're going to be all working in the same space. So the gender I think they're very, very fast now. They don't really make much of a difference in this virtual world. It's all going to be Interesting. So Thomas Friedman calls this uh, a flat world, yes, where um, you know, in the old days you'd be competing against people in your own industry, in your own city, possibly in your own country. Um, he says now the world is so flat that all of a sudden there's one point. Four billion Chinese people standing right next to you. Um, 
you for your job. Uh, and then there's one point two that you need to go standing right next to them competing for your job. Uh, and this is the reality. Pakistan because we, we have gigantic neighbors to you know north and west and uh, um, this is something that we, we will actually uh, talk about a little bit more as we talk about the future proofing uh, your career because even uh, even as you uh, as you start your career things are already changing so uh, very thought provoking answer uh, Dr Khan can you talk a little bit about overcoming barriers uh, especially in our minds Path is that just for men or for someone else or for someone different. Uh, I think there's some truth to some of the barriers, right? I think while we're hoping for a level playing field, it isn't there yet. Women are still paid a lot less than the same job that men are. Uh, if you look at Pakistan, we're ranked incredibly low. I think we're probably second to last on, on the gender ranking in the team. And if you look at our board representation, I'm earlier about that, less than 10% of board seats are taken by women, out of which the majority of women were family members of the, um, the owners of the business. So, so the barriers exist, I, I see them, but I think the larger barriers are many other barriers that are in our own head, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example of that uh, from my own life, from my own career, right? So if you look at the labels on my CV, you look at my school, I went to Karachi Grammar School, then I went to Princeton, then I was at McKinsey in New York, I went to Harvard, and Harvard Business School. You know, I didn't even know these names as I was growing up. My father was an army officer, my uh, grandparents are from Rahim Yar Khan. Nobody in their side of the family had, I don't think the women even went for higher education. Forget the fancy degrees and everything else, it was very much, you know, I remember I did go to I was about six years old because my father was stationed in Kashmir. There were no schools there. So we moved to Karachi, and my parents, what was the name they which is why I think I would, you know, again, people can set you off on a particular track without, which is sort of, you don't know the, the ways in which your life would change, the decision point there. So my parents made me stay for the Karachi Grammar School test for third grade. I was six years old, much younger, but they said, hey, you know, we've heard of this school. I think your like is the best school. I got in and I sort of went off in that trajectory. Um, I went to school with, you know, we lived in a small two bedroom portion of the house, and all my classmates were incredibly wealthy. They went to vacations in you know, France, and I was like, I don't know, I go to Virginia, I can't go I summer vacation to meet my grandparents. So I didn't know. Um, when it came time to apply to college, again, I was incredibly lucky, right? Like, my parents didn't know I was applying. I was like, I sort of sent off 10 applications. I said, you know, I'm going to apply in all these places. I was lucky because I had guidance counselors. I didn't know what it meant. I had never even visited the United States. I had never spent a day away from my home. And so for some reason, I got into all 10 places I applied to. I got a full scholarship everywhere, which is great because my parents could not have afforded it. Um, I went to Princeton and I was like, I don't know what sort of people go there. So I that not people like me, um, you know, I, I don't know what this is, but um, you know the big secret about these places and these labels and everything else is, uh, it's really not that hard, yeah, and it's really not that difficult. People are just like you, and within you, you are able to compete with every single one of them. So, people have this weird awe when they hear of Harvard Business School. It's just another business school. You, you get in, you go there, you work hard. You will be amongst the best people. These are all labels. So a lot of the barriers and the sort of, uh, constraints we put on ourselves are in our own head. And I guess I just wasn't really aware of them. I just kept doing it. I kept thinking, well, this is, I don't know who goes there. It's sort of, again, okay, sure, I'll try it. But it is us, right? You have to push yourself in those situations. It's what JJ said a little earlier. When there is opportunity, Jump out. I think the universe supports you. I think go out and do things and 
strive for the best, and if you do that, things fall in place. You do not ever think that this is not for me because I'm a woman, because I'm old, I'm brown, I'm this, I'm that, I'm from Pakistan, they're against Muslims, they're against this. No, go for it. Uh, and so I believe that more than anything else in life, that you make your own path, you set out on it, and it is people like us who will actually.
Uh, and you look around, uh, you look around the room, uh, most of the people either are either looking for, uh, you know, great opportunities, which you will find, but stop looking at the bigger companies and the bigger places that you've always dreamed about. Or because those dreams were not set by you, are set by your family. A lot of times when I realize, you know, people demand to become doctors because they're family or doctors. <coughs> So the future is extremely bright, terminated to not happening anytime soon. And uh, anytime uh, soon, but it will happen. Well, it's hundred years, years, I don't know, hundred years things are going to be extremely different. But so the movie is saying I'm back. <laughs> I don't know, if you guys want me to, if you can pay for it. <laughs> Say you want to be entrepreneurs. What do you want to do? We will create a new startup, 
we will do uh, we will follow the model of uh, uh, Uber and uh, will come out something. So they are thinking, and now the world is the market. Beforehand, the market was mera mohalla. They could never think beyond that do galiyan, which is probably market hai. So now a, a normal, uh, like I said, females have seen so many housewives using internet. And becoming entrepreneurs and selling their products globally, and I'm shocked because I met few of them, and there was no way that in their life they could have done anything because they were restricted. They had a lot of barriers, and somehow this barrier was everything changed for them. Now they are getting funding, and venture capitalists are looking at them, and all of a sudden they're becoming millionaires. The fact that technology is world. So I think that's something that is existed from the first time. Oh, not necessarily. I don't uh, necessarily agree with the data as well as the global. Uh, I think technology is here to stay, and the more optimism we have about this new thing that is coming, the better it is. One option is to wait around for some government to change things for us. You know that's not happening in time, but in the absence of that, the democratization of the technology has made it easier for a number of people. Right? So, so I'll tell you, give you a very simple example of some uh, from a child from Bangladesh went on to YouTube, figured out how AI works. He is a 17-year-old kid, applied it to mammogram to figure out if the person has breast cancer or not. 17-year-old. It is going to be your passion to be able to do it. So the world is not going to belong to people who just arrived and are now trying to figure out who is going to be the leader, who is going to try and do something. And is there anybody else who is going to try and change my life? That's not what. And that's I think as part of if we are supposed to be a social movement, right? If we are supposed to be smarter, then we need to act smarter. We need to act our own. So I think just sitting around waiting for and saying, hey, uh, by the way, on the low end jobs, I don't agree uh, because it's not going to happen to low end jobs. It's going to happen. Things will happen across categories. So banking will take things in a different way. IT companies will take things in a different way. Textiles will take things in a different way. Agriculture. It's not going to be universal. That all admin jobs are not going to be out. They are being outsourced already, right? So, uh, uh, so, and and when that happens, you know, you have a. So when Tempos launched in Pakistan, back in 2000, you had so many more entrepreneurs who were operating a shop from there. Plumber, you needed to go to a hardware store to get a plumber. All the plumbers are entrepreneurs right there. Right? So the people who took that initiative to become that entrepreneur are successful. So the world. 
world is now tied to the belong to people who want to make a difference in their life, not people who like the people around. And people who choose to be treated like that will be treated like that. So in, in this deal of information, it's not only people who know and people who don't know, because everybody knows. Uh, before, I mean, if you wanted to access some serious hardcore white paper, you had to be in a prestigious college to be able to access the objective next to that. And you would, and only if you had a high paying subscription, you would be able to access it. Now, everybody has access to everything. Uh, TED Talks happen all over the world, and everybody gets access to all that is being talked about. So, if, you're, if people are choosing um, not to. LinkedIn locals happen as well. LinkedIn locals, again, <laughs> a fantastic example. Right? Right. So, I mean, people are getting. You know, there are people in this room who are here because they want to make a difference. They want to understand what the future goes. So, I think things are changing, and things are changing for the better. Uh, again, terminate will not happen. <laughs> I also think Pakistan stands to be more active than other nations. Like, but we are already so low on the scale of knowledge and learning. If you think about technology as an enabler, where I think it is, uh, it has enabled learning across the board. You can go to Khan Academy and learn about everything you want to. You can actually, it is really expensive to do low cost, high quality education, right? Unless you think of a blended learning. That's happening right now. We have investment companies that are actually setting up programs to use in public schools so that education can be provided in a more effective way. We have people who are investing in solar energy so that people, 60 million Pakistanis who live without any energy whatsoever, now have energy available. So it is from learning <coughs> outside. And I think it is actually making everything more accessible. Previously, if you wanted to be an entrepreneur, you were either born into a family that had capital or you just were like wildly lucky. But right now, if you have an idea, you can access all sorts of funding and support and you can do <coughs> that in a way that benefits everyone. So I'm hugely optimistic on technology and I think we have so much to gain. We may, I mean, there may be 15% of our companies or 10 or whatever, we can argue the number, but I think the benefits are astounding and the kind of ways in which it will help us. Kareem at night, they're, they've got the Kareem app switched on at night because they want to get in the, the 12 hours or whatever that Kareem uh, incentivizes them for, and then during the day they're switching over and driving Uber. These are people with zero formal education, right? Absolute, maybe grade five education. And you listen to the math coming out of their heads and you're like, huh? Yeah, care of hype. But the master's here, advanced mathematics make. So, and so he's got this calculated down to the rupee 
कि मुझे यहाँ से इस बारह घंटे का ये आठ हजार रुपए मिलता है और मुझे यहाँ पे मैं जब पेट्रोल निकालता हूँ ये मेंटेनेंस कॉस्ट निकालता हूँ तो मेरा दिन के पांच हजार रुपए तो मुझे दे ही देता है ये और सात हजार मैं यहाँ से निकालता हूँ तो मेरे उसकी शक्ल देख रहा हूँ लिटरली एंडल ऑफ अंडरस्टैंडिंग ऑफ दल्डिंगल Uh, these are people who have who were on the fringes of society. They were unemployed or way underemployed, and now they're netting fifty, sixty thousand rupees a month, which, which by Pakistani standards, is what many of my students who are sitting in the back there will aspire to when they finish their MBAs. And so this is a you know Tisri Jamaat Pass who's, who's making that money right now. Well, let's think of the service they're providing as well, right? Right. Right, and so my daughter can envision today getting into a career from defense and going back to Aga Khan at ten o'clock at night by herself. And of course, her her mother will have a heart attack or multiple heart attacks while she's getting there, but she will arrive fine. Alhamdulillah. Right? Can you imagine doing this with your daughter in a kali taxi or a pili taxi? So the the world has changed, and there are people who are embracing that change. For those, I think uh, Farhan mentioned that there will always be people who will resist it, and for them, it's a really scary world. And but for everyone in this room, I think the future looks pretty bright. <laughs> the future looks pretty bright. Okay, so moving on. JJ, a question for you. Um, I know there's there's a, there's a lot of curiosity about the media industry at large. So can you um, share some of the realities? Uh, they can't all be glamour and celebrity. So, what are some of the realities of working in the media industry? Uh, what is it? <laughs> so, it is all glamour and celebrity. It's okay. all fun. It's all uh, it's showbiz. The problem is uh, when we talk about showbiz, we just talk about the show. But there is a the section that's completely different. So, I think uh, when when we have show. People get excited. People get attracted to it, but it's a very serious business. It's no way all fun and excitement. Uh, it's as boring as any like a lot of the finance is boring. But as I'm saying, the media or the this side is also very good because you have to do go to the same business side, same business model that. You go for anything. It's like setting up a factory. You come in, you say, "Okay, I'm going to start a sugar uh, uh, mill." So what do you do? You go and you say, "Okay, कहाँ पे गन्ना का मिलेगा? क्या आज का करेट है?" And everything that you're doing, you end up doing for on the media side. Uh, it's a relatively new concept, but as uh, I think it's grown and it's matured much faster. And we are just not even two uh, decades old. Like the satellite uh, television started somewhere in 2000, and right now we're sitting in 2018 with a with a hundred plus channels. Mm-hmm. That happens ten years back. Yeah. <laughs> But the thing is that we have matured, and a uh, lot of people see it as just the glamorous side, but it's a very serious business, and it's very competitive, and it's becoming more and more competitive. The only thing is that those liberties that you see, the stardom that you see, you feel that okay, this is all. As I was mentioning, the question in the morning that, uh, sorry, that you see a person standing and talking on the television, but you don't see five hundred people working behind them, and they work twenty four seven, day and night, and it's a ruthless job. Because that one person who's sitting in front for two hours, he's fine or she's fine, but those people who are at the back, they're working day and night, and be it a set maker or be it a cameraman. And they have, they are going on, and they are, and the technology is also changing so rapidly. So they have to upgrade themselves. They have to adapt. Because if I go back just ten years, this kind of a camera was never. Uh, no one could have imagined that this was this would be broadcasting live. Right now we are broadcasting live. Fifteen years back, when I, thirteen uh, years back when I joined the uh, airway, first time we were going live from. Uh, I was very excited. Oh wow, man! I am handling a production where the set is going to the satellite and it's coming down, and I'm controlling it. Now my neither 
boy saying, Baba, I want my YouTube channel, I want to broadcast. Like, you want to broadcast? So, thank you. Why? And, but he can broadcast. <laughs> See, the difference is that the technology is changing so rapidly. And uh, the most, uh, see, negatives are in everywhere. And it's all kind of people that they're in it, or all, uh, it's, it's all the way. So, you will find people, the type of society you have, you will have it everywhere. So, I don't think so that there is anything negative about it. It's just that the glamour side is just part of It's the tip of the iceberg. It's the tip of the tip. See, <laughs> AI, we have two, more than 2,000 employees. Celebrity will be 20. More than 1%. Rest, they all, uh, and they, it's not just that uh, the money factor, uh, uh, everything is separate. But the glamour world is very temporary, it's just for two hours. Like if you have a morning show host, you see her for two and a half hours and she's all glammed up, all make up it. But then, when she comes out, for the next six hours, she's running from one corridor to another corridor, making sure that the guests are coming in, what is the content going to be, it's not easy. And then, the biggest thing, the ratings. So they are That's going the crazy. They have to because let me not let me not talk about ratings today. <laughs> Please, that, that's what we'll, that's a whole uh, that's a whole Pandora's box at this point. So, um, so yes, uh, obviously, ratings need to be and that and that is for Ganda. Okay, I will. Uh, for all of you, so there's actually, actually one of my students here who, who could actually pass as a double for our Um He's sitting here somewhere where he was this morning. Uh, just in case you need a you know, cheaper version, I'm uh, passing copy the key. Aisha, um, Aisha, I have a question for you. Can you talk about some of the common myths that um, uh, about women in the workforce in Pakistan and how the women here can actually overcome those? Uh, should they choose? To I think there's only one myth that I uh, that I can think of, which is that uh, women are not allowed to work in the workplace. They can't maintain a work-life balance. That's as true for men as that is as it is for women. And I also think that increasingly uh, everyone is beginning to realize that. You can maintain that balance. You have got a lot of technology at your disposal. Speaking for myself, I have two boys. And as they were growing up, we had cameras at home, whether I was here or in, in America or wherever, I could check on and see. Have they come back from school and are they doing whatever it was? In so I mean, these types of uh, little conveniences didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. Uh, so we've already come a long way. Women have an inherent advantage anyway as managers and as entrepreneurs because you know their management skills are almost inherent. Even in a parent and grandparents generation, it's always a little girl who would be responsible for the younger sibling. As a housewife, she's responsible for the budget for delegation, for making sure everybody does their own work and everything gets done at home. So those are really uh, sort of advantages that women have when they bring that to the workforce, whether as a corporate employee or as an entrepreneur. So you know, both of myths say that women you know, need extra level of management and they need to have a business class ticket to travel from here to there. I think those have been uh, this is not a world where you can have that gender segregation. I should come from uh, Ivy League and you know, she's come with that pedigree, she's heading an institution. I come from a Patan background, very conservative, completely studied and worked in Pakistan and I'm also heading an institution. So I think it ultimately boils down to are you human, are you committed, are you hardworking? Can you do you know what you're doing? And those are the, the things that have to do that. So uh, I don't know. I don't know what other myths are there about. Uh, so so basically, your advice to women is um, take whatever barriers you have in your head and remove them. Yes, you know, I just said something interesting that uh, there aren't enough women directors on the board. Now the reason is that there aren't enough women at the 
top, you can then be pushed up to the wall. And the reason why they aren't there at the top is because somewhere in the middle, they tend to leak. Uh, many of them join in, they preserve their ambition. So, a large number of young girls join the workforce. But, mid level, you see them dropping off very fast. And the other thing that you see is that they're not vocal enough, they don't fight back. They are less confrontational. I am telling somebody when a man and a woman come to me for their performance of praises, a man will demand a release, a demand a promotion. A woman would be so much easier to manage. <laughs> so, so those things are not good. Maybe it's unique to you. So it's good. Uh, the fact that they are fighting back is a good thing. But over the last, and that's why we've got more women coming on top. But the last 20, 30 years, this is one of the reasons why women have not been able to come right to the top. And the fact that that is changing, uh, you know that it's now law that a listed company has to have open representation on the board. But again, that will come when the stock of women in leadership positions also increases. So, uh, <coughs> that, that, yeah, so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Dr. Khan, you mentioned um, stuff happens um, in the context of seizing opportunities. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, I think I referred to this a little bit earlier, right? I think um, if we think of our life in a linear way, we plan out everything. And by the way, I'm, I'm a huge planner. I like knowing what my next three months look like, what my meetings are in place. I know. Um, Mother as well, so I have four and two young kids, so I have to balance. This requires a lot of planning, right? To go in back and do it. I've always believed work life balance is, is a lie, basically. You prioritize different things. At certain times, your family, so I had a one year old and a newborn, at that point, my work was very different. Right now, my children are older. I can afford to sort of flex into it more completely. There are things. Um, what I mean by stuff happens is a combination of you will come across opportunities, right? If we think about the year in a linear way, and this is going back to Quran and the whole technology will transform everything, I think maybe 20, 30 years ago there was a contract that was in place, right? If you sat down, you worked really hard at your job, whether it was moving the paper from here to here, you spent 40 years doing it, you got a nice retirement, and then you were okay. That contract is not there anymore, right? With some exceptions, right? You know, we all know people who, when they were five years old, five years old, they knew they wanted to be a doctor, and 40 years later, they are doctors, and we're like, great, you know, you have that. For the vast majority of us, we will be figuring out what we want to do by flexing into careers and out of careers. In that scenario, it is so important to be open to opportunities. It is so important to and make that decision and say, okay, I really want to learn about, let's say, education technology. I how am I going to do that? Well, one option is I go find someone at Google. Another option is there are these three startups. Let me just jump in and, and be a part of them. Let me create a startup myself and really learn. So you have to, one, be aware of these opportunities. Stuff happens. Stuff is happening all around you. Right? If someone says that if you recognize an opportunity as an opportunity, Really isn't one. I mean, you wouldn't really know. You kind of have to really push and explore, talk to people, open doors. And then the other thing is, things will go off track. Right? I told you about my own, how I came back to Pakistan, how I am here. Um, again, with HPL, with banking. I thought, all right, this is great. I'm going to now transition into banking, PhD, insurance. This is kind of the interesting career path, how I'll make my mark on society. Um, well, I had. Functionally impossible for me to be a group head while managing an infant and a one year old and not having time to what to do it. So I had to pivot. I had to say, okay, at this point, this is important. I'm going to start consulting and start exploring different options. Um, I met someone, I reached out to my network, I started working with a large private equity fund, um, and then I realized that, wow, there's this whole space out there that seems to be tailor made for everything I'm interested in. 
I think the impact we have is it is that hitting every single thing that is motivating me. With the result that I can now, I said this to my husband the other day, that I don't know where my <coughs> birthday goes. I start in the morning, I could choose to work till midnight and enjoy every minute of it. And I really want to emphasize the enjoy part of it. It is new experience. <coughs> it is helping people. It is actually finding hope in this place and positivity. And I love going to work. And I think you only stumble on these scenarios, I think, for someone like me who wasn't born with this, I have to be something, I have to be this is my craft. Um, you have to be open to stuff happening and to just making the best of it, seeing the opportunity, and then being able to, when things don't go your way, there's this book by the way, I read it to my children, you should read it, it's, it's by Dr. Seuss, it's called The Places You Will Go, and it's just this wonderful, it's a poem basically, and it talks about how we will excel and we all have it within us, we really need to be flying on high and doing everything we choose to do, but he says, you know what, but bang ups and hang ups will happen to you, things will go wrong, you will, maybe you get fired. What do you do after that? How do you pick up and move on? That's what's good. That's what makes you. It's, it's not. I think a career that you could have been would be without any pickup and no transition is kind of a boring one. And maybe you're not growing as much. So um, it's a good thing when stuff happens and it opens up so many opportunities. Um, That's great. Um, I, I use another word for stuff. Um, oh, yeah. I'm looking for broadcasting by. I'm very excited. <laughs> sugar, sugar, the word is sugar. Yeah, and you can't have enough sugar in your life. Uh, Farhan, okay, so big question for you. Uh, what advice do you have for everyone here on how to future proof your career? What are the things that we could be doing today uh, to help ourselves and to help the students, to help younger people get ready for what tomorrow holds? I guess that's quite a bit. Uh, I'm sure everybody does. I think the two key things, and this is overarching, thing, and, uh, and then I'll tell you a few specific stuff. The two most important things that will drive you and make you successful, if that's what you want to be, will be your passion and your ability to pursue it. I think if you've heard any, all of us, I think all of us are talking about the fact that you, know, you really need to enjoy what you do, you really need to appreciate what you do, and have fun with it. And that's when you have two passions. If you are passionate about what you are doing, you will want to learn, you will want to do different things, you will want to explore it more deeply. So passion is critical. Uh, but passion has to also be balanced with perseverance because not everything turns around as soon as you want it. So your ability to stick it out and be able to hold on for as long as you can is going to be critical. Because if you are extremely passionate about it, then you reach it. So that's my overarching. But if you want, you know, if people who are already in, uh, are in specific jobs, want to figure out what to kind of do uh, or to continue to have that job or do something better in it. So first of all, I think you need to start thinking tech. Everything will have technology all over it. Whatever you do. Uh, so which is why it is important to kind of continue to look up, read up, go to whatever it is you can and retain information and uh, available. You should, it should, it should, it should be very difficult. So think about so artificial intelligence, and I can go on another session about artificial intelligence and the kind of stuff that is happening. And, uh, yeah, and pretty cool stuff is this all enabling. Uh, but so start thinking about so anything that you're doing, if you can automate it, you should be able to automate it, right? And I'm not talking about creating a huge algorithm or a software, even if it's Excel that you're using or you know, some other document, you can also create back to it. And so basically try to figure out how technology will enable you, right? And you need to do that. So the last Second, I think you need to be able to take risks. I think the biggest challenge as human beings, we kind of get used to our stable life and then we kind of don't want to take any chance. Right? And I'm not taking, I'm talking about taking risks and saying, okay, I want to end my career right now and start something. I'm not seeing it as drastic as that. But if you think that you're bored with what you're doing and you hate waking up in the morning and what you're going to do and do it again and again every day, then by all means do it. But if you're like most people who kind of now put on to a track and now you kind of been going on it, you don't know whether it's your passion or whether it's not your passion, but you feel that you're doing okay with it and good, then take risks within what you're doing. Right? Try to explore new things, innovate, experiment, what will happen? You know, 
I'm not saying take children everything around. You need to take risk before 10% of your, of your time. If you're able to do that, especially the technology space, you kind of continue to do it. Right? Third thing, I think, is we keep talking about it, but accept change. You know, it's very easy for me to say it, uh, but people who go through it, you, know, you either become very optimistic about how change is going to make you, or you become a pessimist and say, you know, it's going to end my life. It is going to happen. The change is happening. It's not something you can control. It will happen. Right? Which is why you might as well be optimistic about it and see what value you can bring it and how it will help you. Uh, and it will help in, in any position. You know, how bad the economy is, how good the economy is, how bad the company is doing. It will happen. Fourth thing, I think, and I don't think a lot of people talk about this, be human. We're not machines. We're not supposed to be machines. I think in the future, uh, in a lot of the mundane tasks, there will be a lot of value. If, for instance, even when I look at the medical profession, this is just one example. Uh, a lot of the diagnosis, you know, a lot of times if you want the doctor as well, are for very simple reasons like a flu or a bacterial infection, and at least you know, like 20 percent, 30 percent time, you might have to go up for a serious thing. But so those things just become automated. Right? So the machine will be able to diagnose that your medical device is that you know whether you're going to get a flu in the next three days. about it 
seven, eight minutes before the official time that the matter is officially released. So there was a difference. So now that's how the news, how fast the news is. So uh, first change that I think has already happened is that the news is become English. Now we are just resisting the change from the paper to the digital. Uh, I don't know how many of the people sitting in the room, they open up the newspaper every morning and they find something new. Analysis and columns are different. But otherwise, uh, I think you will get out of the room and the first thing you're going to do is check out what the latest happened in the last week. Be it in your social network or be it in the other world. Now, that's the new side. But on the entertainment side, things are changing very well. Uh, there was a time when it used to be just pedestrian channels, uh, cinema and uh, one street. Then came, uh, if we talk about cinema, then uh, it used to be one big street, thousand people used to go there and watch. Came by the places, seven streets, eight streets, and smaller, so you had more options. Television, pedestrian channel, pedestrian channel was one channel, two channels, was very expensive. Then came cable channels, satellite channels. Direct to home, you have 500 channels coming directly with a small uh, 10 inch uh, uh, dish. Now, I believe that after the millennials, that every marketer in this country, <coughs> in this world, is struggling to, with the generation Z is going to come in, there will be no television. And when I say television, I don't mean the streets, the cable, the because it transforms the content will be there. People are still going to watch Bohi, Saad Bohi, Namoy bhi chalenge, Bohi, Terminator bhi chalega. You will have every time. See, news will not change. If there is a victim, if there is a division, stock change, it's news. You can't have a new news coming out. So if there is an increase in Pakistan or something, a bomb blast, anything, news will stay the same. Medium is changing, but uh, how you, the delivery uh, is going to change. In the same way, television, TV, that's going to change. Now it's smart box. <coughs> now, this device is your television. Uh, Netflix, iFlex, uh, Amazon Prime, they are now giving you more options. Uh, there was a time when we used to watch uh, Tanaya and uh, 50 <coughs> once a week. Now, and it comes 26 episodes, you watch it in one go. So it's like uh, this uh, when I started watching it, I Watch all night, my office late was just because I was watching it. And the new season came in, for the first time I realized he is giving me 20 episodes in one go. This is the new form. We are going to do a drama in the next few weeks. See our call, it's on the one. You want to watch it? So the transformation is happening, it has happened. So on the mark, in Pakistan, I think last year there was a bit by Pandora or DTH. Exhibited amount was paid for. And I was like, whoever's gonna take it, they're gonna go for big losses because Netflix is gonna come in, Amazon, Amazon Prime is charging 300 rupees, Netflix charges 900 rupees. But you have the best content that is available. So now the content will be, we will be producing content, but the delivery form will change. And that's where uh, all the new kids or all the new people who are coming in, they should be. Because that's one side. But there's another side where we all are focusing on. If you have formal uh, content, like big movies, drama, but there is another form of content which we don't realize but we consume. That's all of us. This content that you want. Your Snapchats, your Instagram, this is all from your publisher. Your publisher. And what happens is, in Dunya Man, I believe that there's this concept that we are very interested in what's happening in other other person's life. Farhan ki life in Singapore kaisi hai? I'm very excited to know ki kya ho hai, what he goes through. How's Google? Google office, I've heard a lot about it. Kaisa hai? 
this is a curiosity we have. So when we face, uh, when we post our uh, Snapchats or Insta posts, what are we doing? We are telling people, this is, this is what my lifestyle is, this is what I am doing. And people are following. <coughs> what are these new stars coming? 1 million followers, 2 million followers, who are those? It is not celebrity. 16 year old girls who can do very good makeup. My, <laughs> and they have like 7 million followers on Instagram. Exactly. I'm not, and I think I'm joking. Ask anyone here. See, uh, they would have a hard time naming people from the past. And now it's become, yeah. and it's become easy. Uh, I asked my nephew that uh, he was just following some blogger. And I said, why do you follow uh, this blogger? He said, uh, Mamu, he's an idiot. <laughs> he said, what? Yeah, but it's fun to watch him. He's making all these stupid things. And that guy is a billionaire. He's making millions of dollars just by posting that one post. So now, with these smart devices, those big screens, the content has changed. And now everyone can be a content creator. So as we were saying in technology, if I had an idea, if I think I can sing well, I think we 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 can sing well. Now, I can just have a friend of mine, that come on, let's do it, uh, do it. And we start singing and the entire world can share it and I can become a singing sensation in all night. So, with this technology, with the new uh, era of the millennials and generation Z, I think it's the land of opportunity open for everyone. So, we have Shawal Khan and Mayra Khan, but maybe some student from any college doing a theater uh, in the college drama can become a sensation own and they are happy in some It's going to grow now. So I think the opportunities are there for because of just technology and giving you more. Fantastic. So on that optimistic note, um, what do you think about the I would like to open the, the floor for questions. If uh, anyone has a question for the panel, uh, this would be the time. I have a question specifically for the three media uh, experts on the panel right now. Uh, Mr. Rahul, you mentioned that media itself is evolving due to the change in technology and as a result of media practices, especially digital. I, reason, I started reading up about a year ago that some of the world's largest consultancies, Accenture, PwC and Deloitte, are entering the advertising and marketing space by launching digital, what they call digital consultancies. For Deloitte Digital, Accenture Interactive, KPMG, and how um, Do you guys feel that this will, uh, they've already uh, opened their first offices in India as well, they've entered the new market, and they're taking the slight supply away from the agency like JWT, Gulti, Saatchi, and they're affecting Starcom and Mindshare as well. Do you think that uh, if this would come to Pakistan, would it have a uh, immediate effect, or would it something that would take? up to a decade or lesser to really take away uh, affect your the business you guys have right now. See your star phone. Sure. Um, the, the reality is that the uh, the agency landscape is, is evolving very fast. Um, if, you, if you talk to people in, in our agency five years ago and you talk to them about digital, uh, digital anything, uh, the majority of people would have said, uh, ah, it's a, it's a nice to have. Uh, some of our clients actually do understand it. Now, if you talk to, uh, to uh, anyone, whether, whether a Group M or Starcom or any of the other uh, agencies in Pakistan, um, there's a huge understanding that uh, digital is, is one of the main drivers of growth in the industry. Um, now, if, if agencies are not able to adapt and provide actual value-added services to their clients, uh, then they don't really deserve to exist. Uh, this is one of the challenges that advertising agencies, the traditional creative shops, are facing right now. The question that many clients are asking is, okay, uh, should I be spending 40 million rupees on producing a single piece of content, aka the 30-second TV ad, or should I take that 40 million rupees and spread it over 100 pieces of content because my audience will engage with me 100 times in the same amount of money. And the amount of engagement and you know uh, sharing and likes and comments that I will get from 100 pieces of content 
may be significantly exponentially higher than I would ever get from a single piece of content. Um, so media agencies are becoming content agencies. Media service providers are becoming content providers. So it all comes back to uh, if if there is uh, if there is a need, um, companies like Accenture and PwC will come in and fill it. Why would they not? So the idea is that let's not give them the space to be able to do that. Yeah, uh, and here, uh, if you go back two decades, there was a concept of full uh, mm -hmm. service agency. We used to have creative house, they used to have media. Uh, I started from an agency, we used to have its own media buying house, uh, media department. Then media departments transformed into media companies. So, change will happen. It's just that if these agencies are ready to adapt and embrace the new technology. So anyone who comes in, they are most welcome, it's an open market, but you need to adapt because yeah, to your answer your question, I think the agency's model is going to change better. Yes. There, there will be major disruption. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm Brian Toffee. Uh, my question is uh, from all of you with regard to the title of the event, Signal Local. How fast do you see the transition in any kind of business in Pakistan from PR based to these uh, uh, digital spaces? As we know that we are working in a space where if we know people, uh, one of you guys uh, mentioned that you need to have PR, you need to have trends in market to operate. So how fast that is changing for Pakistan? I think it, the, question, the answer does not lie with me. I think the answer lies with the people running the agency. How fast are they willing to accept uh, the new world order? So I really can't. I mean, there are agencies and businesses who are ready for it and want to do it and then do it, and there are agencies who are trying to figure out if they can do it. Or, and if there are agencies but it's a fad. Yeah, it's a fad to go. So I think the answer does not lie with me. The answer lies with the, with the people running those businesses in terms of how fast they want to be. It's, it is changing. Um, and with, you know, as we rightly talked about, this is an localization of, uh, of platforms available. <coughs> so if you're not going to do it, somebody else from some other part of the world will do it. And uh, just to build on that point, it's also driven a lot by the ownership of the companies that are spending the money. So if, if you are the owner of a company, if you're safe, and you don't really understand what digital is, uh, because you're not on digital platforms yourself, therefore you don't see the app. Um, you will prefer that there would be a very large uh, billboard right outside your house with your own brand name on it. Because that way you know that the world is being advertised to you. <laughs> right? um, and you will also request that uh, there are certain channels um, on which your ad should run because your mother-in-law watches that particular channel or your wife watches that channel or your other wife watches that channel. So that's not that's not that's not uh, <coughs> that's not really the, the way of the future. We have clients in Pakistan right now who have come back to us this year and said, 30% of my media spend will go to digital. Figure that out. And they're getting that direction from their global spends. Whereas you know, for the first time in the history of media in the world, digital spending overtook traditional media spending last year. So that globally, it's, it's already happened. It's just a matter of when it will happen in Pakistan. It's already happened. Oh, no, it's already there. But again, I was being a little bit tongue-in-cheek when I said, you know, uh, some people who don't engage in the platform, don't understand the platform. They need to get over it. They, it's already happened, past tense. So. That's, a, that's an education thing that we do pro bono every day. Every day can, every I, can I add to my question that uh, as being in the media and you are talking about content, uh, do you see it more challenging than it ever was as uh, when you are creating one content for 30 seconds and uh, now you have to create those 100 pieces of content and uh, as for uh, 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 AIY, if they have to, uh, they have also to switch medium. So, me as a digital consumer, 
that uh, fame or that uh, followership for content is mo uh, much more timely than uh, as I, I was following a serial on TV. Maybe for six months I was watching the same series, mm -hmm. but uh, on Netflix I can watch a season in one night and then maybe whenever next season comes. Yeah. So Netflix is a different model because you're paying a subscription fee, there's no advertising. Uh, but yes, it's becoming more different. Because initially, like we say that we were competing with 100 channels in Pakistan, we were competing with a lot of international channels. But now, we are not just competing with 100 channels in Pakistan, 1000 channels globally, but we are now competing with hundred thousands of websites uh, and, and millions and millions of consumers. Because you are broadcasting, you are putting up some interesting stuff. And that consumption is taking away my time. So I have to fight with your competition. That's very really getting difficult. But as a layman, don't you think it's the other way around? That with technology now it becomes easier because you've got all the data and you're able to get and you're able to get the data probability who's going to be doing what. And, and that's so what the market is. Like uh, you can reach to the audience with more, much more accuracy. And the good thing is that the consumption of media has increased. Like previously the consumption was 40 minutes. Now the consumption in Pakistan <coughs> You look at it, the urban market, it goes over three and a half hours. So there's a huge. But the difference is that they're not watching hard. television, yeah. they're watching uh, YouTube, they're, watch, they're watching uh, Facebook, they're doing Instagram. They're doing, so that all is consumption. So tomorrow, I wouldn't be surprised if I can see an ad or a, a drama or a mini uh, web, web store based on Instagram or anywhere. So things will change and we are trying to adapt ourselves to the voice to the, the word evolution does not apply. It's a revolution. It's an ongoing state of chaos that needs to be managed uh, somehow because otherwise, you know, the world will end. So, yes. Okay. Maybe, any other questions? questions? Please. Please. Uh, I'm going to return to the cybersecurity domain. So, uh, I'm concerned about that bigger corporations like Accenture, Deloitte have already uh, embraced change in digital transformation. And there's a lot of room for cybersecurity in Pakistan. So, uh, what do you think that in how many span of years uh, the cybersecurity domain will be uh, like? Businesses will really think that this domain is uh, essential for like financial institutions like ATM <coughs> or banking industry has already uh, deployed something, but not the SMEs, the small medium enterprises have not deployed have not worked on it critical data. So, uh, what do you think that how much time would we take to uh, embrace the cyber security and its threats that is now open? How much of it? I can actually ask you a question about How much of a concern do you think it is for the SMEs right now? Have you not? Think, I put any faith in cyber security? Yeah, I think not have, I'm assuming the SMEs have to put a lot of faith in cyber security. Uh, so, how much of a risk do you think they're at? So, that's your start, right? So, that's basically, I don't think a lot of people are there. And uh, so, it's not about waiting some, for some international player to come in and uh, create a you know, demand or need for it. I think it's about the local guys telling them that this is a problem and yeah. giving examples. So, I think it's a more a function of how you will uh, package and propose the solution. Uh, because it's kind of ahead of the curve a little bit on this question of Pakistan. So obviously it's going to be a, a slightly uphill task. But the opportunity is if you're the first one or the earlier ones to enter this, then you have a problem. So I don't know, I think in terms of speed or in terms of timing, I think it's a matter of you know, people like you who are trying to make change. And, you know, how well are you able to go and spread this message or so I could say you know, maybe another couple of years, but you know, that is a good number. In this talk, you also touched upon how creators are important. So my question is, how are big media buying agencies such as uh, ARY Digital and others, uh, how are they facilitating these creators and how are they using these creators to their advantage in the future? Because I understand that is the future as a creator myself. We're already doing this. <laughs> I, think, I think it's already, uh, the process has started. So, uh, for us, uh, Overall, the landscape has suddenly become so vast because uh, 
previously we needed talent we had to advertise kaha dalenge log nahi aate now it's become much more easier so uh, in every side it's the communication uh, it becomes so uh, easy that if uh, we are looking for new talent we just have to make a single digit post and <coughs> thousand people will come in and it's much more easier for them to give their auditions on phone so you don't need to come out like one of the things that i see a major change a lot of girls are now coming into media which was a uh, considered uh, like no go area media mein nahi hai mai ladkiyan hi hai now i see girls in different categories we see guys in different genres uh, they are in uh, they behind the camera they are dops they are pehle hota tha wo aap makeup karegi ya designing karegi that's it now they are everywhere the television uh, if you look at it all the writers the main writers are now from our our teammates aapko main writers bahut kam milenge and how they doing it they doing it because they are they have uh, these computers at home they they can just sit at home and they can show the world so obviously what you saying is but become much more easier getting access to television channels is now much more easier our linkedin bank you will just type our names and you will get the uh, you will be able to connect with us and lot of people do reply or there is any uh, help other than those queries that i am just a graduate and i am looking for a job can you help me this way still i mean that but otherwise you if you have an idea you can do it that's it yeah the team was saying who is a big investor run the runs back and recent people on posted on linkedin uh, he was at an event where he was with 12 of uh, the companies that he invested in and uh, when when asked how do you know these people um, that you've invested with his response was was 10 out of these 12 companies cold called me on LinkedIn so there was no prior knowledge there was no prior connectivity they just contacted Naveen on LinkedIn and uh, and set up that meeting and got the investment and and you know the, the, the companies are working together so it you know there are very powerful tools that are in your hands uh, i recently got many of my students to sign up for twitter and uh, and i'm so glad that you talked about you know uh, how uh, what a powerful tool it can be if uh, if used properly um so we're going to take just two more questions and then we will uh, we'll be ending for today um yes uh, okay and you already talked about an issue that you raised you know uh, technology is coming in what will happen to the people that don't have access to it so we uh, worked on an experiential learning project where we took tablets and we gave it to students in rural areas and they ended up learning math and english without anyone actually teaching them they were just given the task and they figured it out like uh, mr karan pointed out you know when technology comes in people actually just it's human nature you kind of actually go out and figure it out all these drivers that you're talking about at uh, my personally my driver was not educated but he learned the cell phone when he came to town when he came to karachi he realized he like has to learn so he actually took out the time so it is individuals who want to learn eventually that do end up bringing about that change but at the same time here is where my question arises uh something that mr jurjeet pointed out he said you know his nephew is watching shows just because they're funny or stupid so where do we as people who have that influence of power come in i kind of take society from dumbing down and watching these stupid videos <coughs> to a more responsible place and where do we come in as people who have that privilege to do that and uh, that's my question to all four So you more to do so yeah just to clarify he also uh, is using uh, yeah. yeah. he is using youtube to do his homework and he did my research at time spent time watching thank you 10% <laughs> <laughs> the thing is it's up to us how to be so if i am allowing my kids to watch just the bad stuff it's my responsibility the stuff is all always there always be there but always be available uh, is the parent uh, guidance or the uh, when you have those uh, movie when you go to movies you see pg ratings and you see it in class why are those i've seen in pakistan i've seen parents bring kids to early movies 
what you want to achieve. Because unless you don't know where you're heading, what you want to do, you will never get there. So yes, it's difficult to understand that what is your final, but you know that you want to do this. You want to do this. I can give you an example, I was 22 years old. I went for this conference in Hong Kong and I was sitting there and this 32 year old guy, he was chief operating officer for Columbia Transfer. And while sitting there I thought, okay, by the time I'm 30, I must be a chief operating officer for some company like that. I just set my goal. I wasn't aware <laughs> how will I get there and I started working. At that time, there were no, there was no air there, there was not even an order I would be there. But when I was 28, I did become one. I worked very hard. There's no question on that. But again, I had the goal. I, I, my mind was exactly set. This is where I have to be. And when you know that this is what your target is, you will work hard, and that's, and if you have passion, you will reach there. Some will reach slow. Don't think that, okay, someone is growing faster than you. Eventually, everyone will do it. It's like when you're in college, someone has done a course first, but eventually, they all will end up doing their masters or their bachelors. So, if someone has done a course first, that doesn't mean that they will do it also better. So, go with your pace, but have a target set. This is what I ultimately want to do. And you will reach it. And what uh, AJ is referring to, right? So, they've done a lot of studies. Economists have done some studies on what design distinguishes successful people from the ones who aren't that successful, right? So they looked at, at children and tested them at various stages and they said, what, what is the quality that distinguishes the ones who end up becoming CEOs and, and you know, doing amazing things? And they found two things. Um, they found the first thing is talent. Right? Talent is just, I would define it as when you're learning something, you are able to learn it fairly. That maybe that was in IT as well, in a way. And we found out that that's not really it. It wasn't talent or IT that determined eventual success. It was something called grit, which is persistence, which is what they did. And I think everyone here is talking about it. It's this ability to just continue at something, right? Not in, a, not in a way in which you sort of aren't mindful of the larger goals, but to actually persist, not get bored, not move away. And work hard. And this is a quality that I think we can nurture and grow in ourselves. There is that some of us who are more gritty than others, they are the born a certain way. And you see, even at a young age, some kids will attack a problem and stick with it and be like, I am going to solve it. Others will say, Okay, I tried, it's not working, I'm moving on to something else. Um, we can nurture that quality in life. And that's what will really help you. you know, that muscle. I mean, I sometimes just take my kids to boring places. <laughs> yeah, like you have to learn to deal with boredom in life. You have to learn to deal with situations you don't enjoy and can't control. And you have to develop that muscle. So, um, yeah, I don't know how much we like it, but I, I'm hoping it's going to be good for us in the future. And we can work on it. I think also you have to try and learn from uh, and make the best of any situation. I know when I am uh, working in a bank, everyone wanted to corporate banking or investment banking or the front office. And I had to spend six months in basically the back office where we were making checks and sort of reconciling the books. And it was uh, when as unglamorous as it gets, I used to sit with all the rankers in the bank. Um, people who've been there for 40 years doing the same thing. But you know, I used that opportunity to learn what the heart of the bank was at that time. How all the different areas in the bank were connected. Uh, what made one area do better than the other? It's so you know we were, I was able to get to the bottom of a lot of areas which I wouldn't have had I been just in a front office. So everything that you do ends up adding to your uh, your knowledge bank, to your understanding, and it helps you in the future. So there's nothing which is too petty or too small. Everything that you do and you learn will add to your uh, capacity. And I think that's one of the things that I've often seen. When you, you, you graduate, you want to have the most glamorous job, you have this thing in your head, but you know you really have to start at the bottom and be ready to do that hard work. Do you question it as a student or as a person who's already worked? 
If you're passionate about something, you want to turn into your own business, is that something that you want to do, or if you want to go work for someone, there are many ways to connect with that organization, many more ways than there were previously. So before you only had your counselor from your institution or the HR department that you have to physically go into work with. But if you're passionate and if you can showcase yourself better than the next person and there are a variety of ways to do it, you get it creative, you will end up getting that role if that's what you want. But just wasting around saying, okay, I, you know, I sent them a LinkedIn thing and I emailed them my resume. It's not going to cut it. So at Google as well, I tell you, uh, I don't know if it's a confident or not, but about 3.5 million people apply every year. You know, not everybody is going to get there. But if you're able to stand out from the crowd, and if you truly think you're passionate about it, you should be able to do it. Thank you. That's really helpful. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys, and girls, for coming out. Uh, before we go, there's two things we need to do. Uh, one, I would like to... Uh, thank the, uh, the guests for coming out. And it is sort of Valentine's Day. So... Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm coming to the ladies' choice. Absolutely. Um, she will be here. Thank you.